Saludo, amigos. Greetings, friends, crew member of our beloved, polluted, and unique spacecraft, which, since the last time we met, has taken another turn about its imaginary axis, and of course, continues creating events in full development. Whenever I am not standing up with my back against our map, it is because we have a guest. And whenever we have a guest in Dosia, we always have very important guests. With you, I would like to introduce right now the ambassador of the Republic of Syria. Khalil Vitar, the ambassador of the Republic of Syria in the Bolivar Republic of Venezuela, born in Rabak, Syria. His training, 1983, degree in literature and French civilization in Damascus University. And about his career, very successful. Since 1989, he has worked in the Foreign Affairs Minister of Damascus, attaché and secretary of the Syrian Republic in Santiago de Chile, secretary of the Embassy of Syria in Buenos Aires, Argentina, advisor and minister in charge of business in the mission of Syria with the Office of the United Nations in Geneva at Interim Business Manager of Syria in Santiago de Chile. In January 2017, Ambassador of the Syrian Republic in the Bolivar Republic of Venezuela. A polyglot, as a good diplomat, he speaks Arab, French, Spanish and English as every diplomat. We need to add something. In the positions he has been abroad, he has worked in different meetings about human rights and many, many others that we are not going to have the time to read today. Welcome, Ambassador. It is a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much for inviting me and for granting me this opportunity that I would like to take advantage of. I would like to greet all the viewers of VTV. I am at your disposal for any question. But there is a wide range of matters. However, you are clearly dedicated with your words, so I will try to speak about the overview of things. So I would like to speak about the Middle East, first of all. So what are the most important interests that as of today we have in order to avoid peace, progress, and fraternity in the Middle East. I do have some ideas about this, but I want to hear your words about this. The only obstacle that we have in order to have permanent peace, fair, and long-lasting peace in the Middle East is Israel. And this is the honest truth. Everything that has been happening in Syria for over seven years this is all related to the state of Israel. Unfortunately, this terrorist war that has been imposed over Syria, where the jihadists have participated, as well as terrorists of over 86 different countries, supported by regional forces as well as international forces too, that with a project of dividing Syria in four or five different cantons or four or five pieces based on their religion and to make of Israel the biggest piece of land in the area and also to handle every single of these smaller countries. However, thank God we have been able to end this conspiracy. We are defeating as of today 
We have fled most of Syria. Over 19%, over 90% of the country of Syria is free of international tourism. And there are still some parts left occupied by the stakeholders, the main stakeholders, which are armed forces coming from the country of Israel in the Syrian Golan, the Syrian Golan, the occupied Syrian Golan. Because apparently when you see international agencies, Golan is only Israel. I've been in the Golan and I know the strategic value it has for this area. The Syrian Golan, which has been occupied, its surface is 12 100 kilometers, square kilometers, where there are Syrian citizens who live under the occupation of the Israelis. And this is a permanent aggression according to international law. And additionally, well, we must state that there's a Turkish intervention in the Athens zone and also some other areas. And this is once again another violation of the Syrian sovereignty. And there are certain areas where there are American forces, specifically in the Tanif area, in the border with Jordan and Iran. And in the north of Syria as well where there are American posts in areas dominated by Qassad forces. Forces for peacekeeping? No, no, no. They are American forces. All the military existence in a sovereign country, all the foreign military presence is a violation of a country's sovereignty. Well, I worked with so many years with the nations that I often use these euphemisms. Well, let me tell you, we are like in a province, it's called the Ingleb province, located at the northwest of Syria, where terrorists who didn't want to have a conciliation with the nation occupied today and decided to reach this province. But sooner rather than later, the Syrian army is going to free this area. So what's the idea? To divide this zone? Well, I think that this is over. I don't think it will ever happen again. And today the majority, as I said before, is in the hands of the government and the Syrian army. Today, well, there is an official statement, however, I read in the news early today, that areas dominated by Kurdish forces well, an agreement has been reached with the government in order to give the oil grounds to our government, my government, and as of today, occupied areas or foreign areas are there, those who have to leave the Syrian territory. They don't have another option. How many foreign forces do you have there? As I mentioned before, there is Turkey in the Athen area, there are American and French soldiers as well, and Israelis who also intervene whenever the Syrian army was advancing and freeing the territory, they intervened with missile attacks and bumped the Syrian military post. And this is something that should be taken to the United Nations. Why doesn't it thrive? Well, Syria 
Dustin always posed this type of claims to the Secretary General of the United Nations. Well, we are aware of this, but there are bigger blocks that work there in order to neutralize these initiatives. Well, that is true. Today, we are preoccupied about the struggle against terrorism against Syria. And it no longer is a local matter. It happens globally, terrorism as of today. Because as I mentioned before at the beginning of this interview, the jihadists are mercenaries of over 86 countries. This is a difficult thing to assimilate, however. It is fashionable. As a state, I will not have a good image if I do the things that I have to do. However, I train a group of mercenaries that I pay and destabilize countries. However, the United Nations are ready to stop these claims. The United Nations well, try to avoid these type of things, and it would be worth speaking about them. Let me tell you about something very interesting. Lobbies are very powerful as well. Indeed, the Syrian crisis or the war against Syria. When the Security Council of the United Nations created the resolution 2254, which accepted or authorized the fight against terrorism in agreement with the government of Syria, which is the legal and rightful government, well, it was decided that the state didn't want to carry out a coordination with the Syrian government because it didn't acknowledge it. And it came there after this meeting, after this resolution, or to create a coalition together with around 20 countries of the Western world who decided to fight against terrorism. But it's exactly the opposite. Based on the information that we hold, they were helping terrorists, particularly the ones called Daesh. ISIS. And I clearly remember that in the year 2016, and after two years of resistance of a military pause of Syria in the area of Resor, which borders Iran, well, American aircraft attacked this post and in a matter of half an hour or an hour, well, terrorists came in order to occupy this area. And this is a sample. Well, the same thing happened in the city of Raqqa when the forces of the American coalition destroyed the city of Araka completely. And there are eyewitnesses who bear witness the helicopters of the United States Army brought the people of Daesh to a different area in order to fight against the Syrian army. Well, Daesh is a very conspicuous terrorist group. Could you tell us what's the beginning of this group? Who provides them with the logistics and allow them to do so in a diplomatic or political position? Well, it is actually manufactured by the United States. So it is created by America. With whose government? Well, it's just like Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan and then Iraq. We don't know. Wait. Where they're going to use it after the defeat of these terrorist groups in Syria? They could likely use them in any other place of this world. I remember Iraq, the Kurds, the Shiites, and the other groups. It was a magnificent country, but they decided to destroy it. 
Gaddafi's Libya was a country made of tribes and of a desert that worked perfectly. And every leader spoke with Gaddafi and they would reach a solution as if they would speak to their parents. That's their tradition. But what is happening today? They are out in the map of the Middle East. And I believe this is not something new, that based on the interest of Israel and the pro-Israeli lobby of their states, it's one of the most important ones they do so. Of course, Walter. Listen, they started with Iraq. This is clear. Iraq had the seventh the strongest in, in military the forces of the world uh, back then. And they were very respected because they bought a lot of weaponry. They were a great customer. Well, finishing the Iraqi army back then was affecting the negotiator or at least weakening the Arab negotiator at the business table together with Israel. So they blew them away from the map. So this war against Syria after seven, seven and a half years, the objective was to weaken the Syrian army as well. And everything that we can see today in relation to the Saft al Qaran, this is an Arab world, which means the business of the century. And it's ending the Palestinian cause, which for Syria is, has been, and will always be, our compass, our compass for the Syrian politics. And today, just like two months ago, the American president acknowledged Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. And they also brought their embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. And this, I think it's a commitment of Trump's campaign. The electoral campaign is, listen, I just need to become a president and my strategic decision as soon as I establish my administration will bring my embassy to Jerusalem. Well, it was a pending topic. But before Trump, not other president dared to do this. No one of them was willing to do so. But today, after weakening Syria, occupying them with this war, it was the last, the last place against Zionism and international imperialism. And we don't know if our Arab brothers in Saudi Arabia or the Gulf will also acknowledge, just like the states, this, this country because they're puppets for America. I often have a judgment of value, and I don't think, or I'm not sure if it's a uh, cartoon, but I think that there are many monarch and vertical governments concerned about having a crown, and they don't think about the brothers and the cultures related to them. And fortunately, this is the reality. This is the truth about the events happening. During his visit to Saudi Arabia, President Trump last year, he brought with him $500 billion. Just a tip, huh? $500 billion. Yes. This was destined for Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. And Qatar, who wasn't willing to pay, they were punished then. And they created a conflict between Saudi Arabia, the Ar United Arab Emirates, and Egypt on the one side. However, Qatar was on the other side. So Qatar was the only country that created their own public policy somehow related to this. Yes, something like this. Well, people want to keep their heads and their crowns, right? And in order to keep the crown and their throne, they needed to pay. 
because President Trump promised that in order to look after the countries of the Gulf, well, they needed to pay him to be protected, and he carried this out. Well, it's like the gangsters in the time where alcohol was prohibited, and it's really a blatant policy. Well, he is a businessman who always know how to react and how to negotiate. However, well, he is basically a pirate, but his, his policy is disgraceful. He violates all resolutions. Yes, he has broken many agreements, many international agreements, and others weren't broken, however, he withdrew from them. And today, lately, he withdrew the nuclear agreement with Iran. And he wants to force Europeans to do the same thing. They haven't been able to fight against Iran. And I don't think they will be able to do so. Persian history as well as the desire to progress with technology well, it's something that they haven't been able to stop. They haven't been able to do so with Iran or Syria. They haven't been able to do so. Spring and Arab. Could you explain this? Well, the Arab Spring has been carried out with the sacrifice of the Syrian army, of the Syrian people, the national union of the Syrian people with their government, with their leader, who have been able to defeat the conspiracy and the war against them. And additionally, ever since our former president, may he rest in press, he decided strategically to become self-sufficient because we suffered three attacks from our Muslim brothers one of them took place in the 70s, the other one in the 80s, and the last one, the last attack was also done by our Muslim brothers. So this is the project they have in Syria, because they're at the service of international imperialism. This may sound like a cliché, but this is the reality, because with a satellite connected world, it's difficult to close difficult things. Well, the past century was different. There were other characters who were willing to go to war. We're going to tell them what things were if we win the war. If not, we are not going to do so. And this came, of course, from the West. And some people were willing to go to war, but they didn't want any, any journalist. Well, journalists can create a satellite connection with just a backpack and tell whatever they have to say from the site where things are taking place. It's not different as if someone would report this after it happens. Well, this has two sides. The issue related to information and the media, because in Syria, this was carried out in the worst possible way. Before everything happened in Syria, the network Al Jazeera created movie studios in order to film movies about what was happening in Syria. They built cities out of carton and they had some type of theater or drama where they showed the world fake information about the events taking place there. So all just Syria that looked like a new alternative for this world was a manipulative thing for them. Yes, unfortunately, this is the truth. I don't know if you have realized 
las declaraciones del ex primer ministro the uh, statements Al-Tani, of the former prime minister Hassan Al Tami in an interview with the BBC with the Kerry channels well, where he said that the United States and Saudi Arabia were in charge were decided to finish up with Syria and we paid over 135 billion dollars to destroy Syria 135 billion dollars to destroy Syria to finance, to train and to provide weaponry for them but Saudi Arabia and the United States Agreed, agreed to do so, and they took us away from Syria, and the prey got away. The prey is, of course, Syria. And Syria was thankfully able to get over this. What is the current situation? You have a lot of cultural training and also a lot of expertise and enough hierarchy to tell us a real opinion about this. Well, ever since the beginning, Syria has made a decision. They opened the door for the conciliation with the Syrian armed groups and they want to return to the state and they wanted to fight terrorism until the end until they would be able to get rid of the Syrian territory to the last inch we're overcoming this situation right now and we're going through the stage of rebuilding Syria. This is interesting, isn't it? Of course, because when you have a pressure as such, well, you cannot rebuild. You will have to try and persevere. And this shows the really step forward, a real one. This reconstruction doesn't bring in the country who participated so when I showed my credential I spoke to President Maduro and Venezuela is invited to participate in the reconstruction of Syria because we value the position of Venezuela to support our causes in Syria and every single other fair cause in the world ever since the time of leader commander Hugo Chavez especially during the last two years 2015 and 2016 when Venezuela was a non-permanent member of the Security Council of the United Nations and provided us with all their support. So Syria is inviting all the countries to rebuild Syria. And the president has aimed the chancellor to speak about this with the minister of housing and we are now speaking with the ministry of foreign trade today on July 25th, where there's a delegation of Syrian Venezuelan diplomats in a Congress for Reconstruction in Syria. And he promised to participate in the International Fair of Damascus in its 59th edition that is going to take place on August 5th 
August 6 actually and to August 16 and I hope that this will take place and to have Venezuela as a participating country because our countries depend on one another because we are facing the same front against international imperialism and this is also something that Venezuela is going through in this economic embargo from the United States with the sanctions of the European Union too. That's why we have all means possible to help each other. Well, if Dossier can contribute to this meeting and to this synergy, we're at your service. But now, let me ask you the following. I often say there's someone sinister. This is, of course, a commonplace, but there's a clear will of changing the geopolitical map of the Middle East. Is there not? Well, not, of, not all countries will allow this to happen, but either way, I reckon that the aggression is it still near Damascus? However, not there. There will not be at least a geopolitical change foreseen as of now. We don't know what the Western world wants. And there's something that really calls our attention. Why did the Arab Spring attack the republics in the Middle East? Why didn't they attack monarchies? Why didn't it come to Saudi Arabia? or Kuwait, or the Emirates, or Qatar. And if we speak about North Africa, we speak about Arab countries, Morocco, for example, why is nothing happening about this? Well, because the target was Syria. And when I think about this, the will of helping the Syrian world for democracy, for human rights, for freedom, well, as you might be aware, the second political position of Syria is in the hands of a woman. And this is very interesting. I am very happy that you spoke about this. Well, the second most important person in Syria is a woman, the vice president. There are four or five women ministers in the Syrian government. Women are officers in the army. There are also officers in the police for their lawyers. They are judges, they are diplomats. And, well, the exact opposite happens in Saudi Arabia, where women were just allowed to drive a car in Saudi Arabia. The only one who held a permit was a woman who wasn't only a doctor. She was also in charge of bringing children of people from the crown. Well, yeah, this is true. She was the only one with that driving license. And the reason for this was because harems usually have a lot of birds. So who could think that Saudi Arabia want to bring democracy or human rights to Syria? Well, but they are the owners of sacred places, aren't they? No, 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 they're just taking advantage of them. They're collecting a lot of money. This is a business for them, a business just like important as oil, because all pilgrims go there. Pilgrims come from all places of the world to visit sacred places for Islam. 
Today, there is a request from many Islamic countries for the directorate of the sacred places to be in the hands of Islamic countries or the Islamic Conference. And Saudi Arabia is not willing to accept this because it's a very big business for them. With all due respect, they have their own Vatican. Yeah, exactly. And pilgrimage means money, means tourism, means the creation of a nation. Now, what are we to expect from the Middle East, where the United States are already needed up, the pro-Israeli lobby of the United States is there together with the institution for the lobby of weaponry. Some people often understand this happening, the groups of power are the ones who decide this. From the Syrian point of view, what has changed for good or for bad with the current president? There is something very, very interesting. The Israelis just created a resolution declaring Israel as a Jewish state. Who declared this? The Parliament of Israel. Agnesit. They are the ones who issued a statement declaring Israel as a Jewish state. So I'm shocked as a journalist because I didn't didn't get these messages yet. But of course. I knew that we were going to have a very, very important interview, we so I didn't read the news. So yeah, there was an election and they won. Well, if a vote is the one who will let you win, then this what happens. Now, with your analysis, this would seem like a non-important resolution, however, it is very important. This means apartheid. Apartheid, just like in South Africa. It is a state for Jewish. It is a state for the Jews, for Arab Palestinians who have been kicked out there for a long time and they don't have the right to return. And the ones living inside the occupied land of Israel, they'll have to leave sooner or later because according to them, it is a Jewish nation. So back to your question. Events related to those managing politics in the States, we are aware that there are centers for strategic research. And any president who manages politics in the States is using the studies that come from these strategic lobbies or hubs. Well, Kennedy has decided not to be guided by this. However, there are issues related to the president, who is now Trump. Of course, Trump is pro the Israeli lobby. Kennedy's had culture, they had background to become heroes, even John Fitzgerald, who was a Navy hero. And they did not have a single commitment. So what was the only thing to do? Well, was to shot them. And the ones 
who are managing politics in their states are the owners of the money, of the finance, manufacturers of weapons, and also the owners of the media. This is the parallel lobby to reality. They used to call me insane when I said this. They told me that you also needed to be part of the public opinion. So you need to work both with your operations and also with the media. Satellites are for civilians today. So due to technology provided by the Germans, well, they taught us how to do this. B1 and B2 was the background. We wouldn't have anything against the American people. No one, no one cares about them. The problem are the ones in charge, politicians. Those who are creating a conflict in order to manufacture weapons and sell them. And also dominate resources. As someone said, what we need from economy today is a short war, a lovely short war in order to revitalize the economy. And I remember, and I have said this here before, that the diplomacy school, of course, as the professional ambassador that you are, the School of Diplomacy of the States is the Fletcher School for Law and Public Diplomacy. I was invited there in the Prussian Republic to participate in a seminar to study the lobbies. So I went through the states, from north to south, from east to west. It was an excellent training. I took great advantage of this. I have my own diploma at the Fletcher School. I'm very thankful and proud of it. But they never spoke about two lobbies. Oil lobby will go to Texas, lobby of agriculture with the one they pressure many countries, then they go to Iowa, the ones with the Far East, they go to San Francisco. Of course, the NATO and the Atlantic with New York and their nations, but never. And I said this proudly, I was one of the best students, but also one of the few who upset the professors. They never spoke about the industrial lobby, that is also about technology and weapons, that is about a lot of money, and the pro-Israel lobby, that is legal and works perfectly, but it wasn't part of the curriculum. So this will never work with this lobby. And this is true, this is the reality. They knew how to play with this. Any American president the first visit during the election campaign or after the election always have to be to Israel. But it is so clear that if you see the files, you can see this repeating itself as a constant. So it is very, very difficult to see someone with an independent policy from these factors of interest. And how does this affect you? Well, we are lucky enough to resist against this policy of the empire. We're lucky enough to do so. If we would surrender, then we will be subject to them forever. So then you will no longer be sovereign. We could lose something if we resist, of course. But we're going to stay alive and we're going to be stronger at the end, as long as we resist. This is the luck that we have. And I think that we're going to be the winners at the end. 
it is how lucky we are to defeat them. Inshallah. You speak some Arab, don't you? Pero cuénteme una cosa. ¿Cómo están en este momento las relaciones something. bilaterales? What do you think today about bilateral relations between both countries? Well, we have some very good relations with the Bolivar Republic of Venezuela. And there's a relation between both peoples. Desde hace más de 100 años llegamos, llegaron a esta tierra bendita. And then y, eh, que, they came to uh, this blessed land. Bueno, recibió a estos nuevos inmigrantes y bueno, les ayudó en todo. And they helped these migrants, they helped them with everything. Se en and la migrants also de integrated to the Venezuelan Entonces, society as well. Uh, Do we Sirio still have Venezolano. the sí, Syrian Lebanese? Yes, there's a Syrian Lebanese Venezuelan hub. There's one here in Caracas. There are 30. I would used to go there because they had some delicious food. We have 30 clubs nationally. And diplomatic relationships have started since the 60s, and they were strengthened with the arrival of Commander Chavez with his first visit to Damascus in 2006. His second one was in 2009, and with the visit of our President Bashar to Caracas. In 2010, there are 47 agreements reached between both countries. This is a stage of revising these agreements. Bueno, las, uh, and the political relations we hold are excellent. We hope that economic relations will be just as good as the political ones because both of us need each other. I don't know if this is a question that could be somehow accountable, but this is what you have to do as a journalist. What is the main problem you have as a country? during this position in uh, this area. Our problem today essentially is the occupation from Israel. We are extremely concerned about this because there has been 10 years of negotiation with Israel since the 90s and until 2000 with direct negotiations and indirect negotiations but we still haven't reached a final agreement because I, I don't know the word it is a state that wants to take over a big chunk of the territory in the Nasser states that, well, the borders go from the Euphrates to the Nile. So, yeah, I was there. I was there in Agnesen. And we have reached an agreement with the former First Minister, Prime Minister of Israel, Al Rabim, in the year 2000. He's a very progressive person, but also a war hero who was willing to make his own decision. It cost him life. Well, uh, an insane person was accused of killing him. No one, no one could control him, uh, and they sent a hired gun to kill him. He wanted peace. He said mm, that's enough war, we need peace. And well, this person wants peace, so they sent someone to kill him. 
He had an, uh, deposited in the North American direction a promise of leaving the occupied land to the borders until 1967 based on the United Nations resolution. And they called the president back then and our president went to Geneva. President Clinton also went to Geneva and who are the former Prime Minister of Israel also went there to sign a peace treaty. So they needed to do something against it. So they met and told the president that they wanted to stay and keep only a couple of meters along the Bariyat Lake. And President Habad Assad didn't accept this. And he cannot accept this because he said, if, he, if I were to accept this today, this would mean that the Syrian people would say that he treats on the cause. So it's a historic responsibility that he wasn't able to take. It was the worst one. And this all sounds familiar because I studied. I was lucky enough to study in the Pio School of Uruguay founded in 1870, and they taught us with a great sense of humanistic culture, with that dogmas, but how we could take from the scriptures examples that could be projected to right now. Whenever you think about this, you think about the Bible and whatnot, but they were unable to allow a president to make a decision. It was very, very difficult, and of course the lobbies it's an expeditionary force. Don't worry about the problems with language. It's perfectly easy to understand it. Well, I think that not all diplomats most of them don't show their true colors in an interview. However, you've taught us certain things, you've clarified others, but what else do you have to say? You have all the freedom of the world to say whatever you want in this show. At any level, what would you like to say so that our viewers get to know about this? about this matter and any other matter. Well, we're working in order to strengthen the bilateral relationships we have with the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. And we are working with the Chancery, with other ministries. And we, we hope to be successful you have some time yes i'm just checking the clock before ending i would like to greet all the venezuelan people and also the syrian and arab community in this country i would like to wish them peace and security for this brother and friend country. And I always remember that in my interviews there has always been an input provided by Commander Chavez to the relationship of our countries with our President Rosal Sad as well. He traced a very clear path to defend ourselves, to defend the sovereignty of all the peoples of the world, of all the countries. Chavez had an independent policy, and he thought about the interest of the bigger nation, of the Netherlands.
and once again will have to say what a doctor from the States told me. He signed with his name last name. My name is Doctor, name, professor of this university, of this class, in this country, in this city. And he said, Chavez was already ill, and he said, what Chavez has could be created by micro-radioactive particles of a higher density. So at any banquet, someone could serve him a dish, and that's it. And I have said this more than once. And when I visited a neighbor country, they say, look at the person who Chavez brought. And Chavez said, well, who brought this servant? I didn't bring anyone. This is someone different than the person who was with me. And these are details that are subject to review. I'm not the owner of truth, but some remind me of this. And he said, my name is Dr. Such, professor of this university in this city of the state. Chavez was fighting with his disease. This could have been induced by radioactive high-density microparticles. And it wouldn't be the first case, of course. Also, Arafat, the Palestinian leader, suffered from this. And some people say that Jamal Abdel Nasser, and of course, yes, this isn't the first case, of course. I always remember this. Well, that's why. Castro was so careful all the things he did. But Chavez trusted everything and everyone. And when he visited Colombia, he visited Colombia, our brother country, there was someone in particular who brought him his food. I'm not trying to insinuate anything, but I remember that this was said by someone of Colombia. This is very, very interesting. We have two minutes, two minutes left. We just have two minutes where I would like to request of you to send the message. But before that, I would like to give you this. This is a very important and heavy book. The words and phrases of Hugo Chavez, the legacy. I wrote the prologue of this book, and I would like to give it to you as a souvenir so that in the future, wherever your duty takes you, this is a very valuable work for us. This is a very important editorial effort for the compilation work it brings for how it has been ordered and the hierarchy it has. And because it was created with love, and of course I never thought I was going to be chosen to write a part of this book. And saying this is enough. So, coordinator, what do we have? One minute? We have a single minute, which in TV could cost us million dollars. Well, it depends on the show. Today, this is at your disposal. My message to the Bolivarian people of Venezuela, our brothers and friends, is for you to be a country in peace with security. And the best path to solve problems is the dialogue between everyone. And I can tell you that no one outside of the borders of Venezuela could want or love Venezuela more than Venezuelans themselves. That's why the only road, the only path, is dialogue between all Venezuelans to take this country, this beautiful country forward. Dear viewers, here I close dossier. If you listen with attention, you will be able to understand the clear things that we have mentioned. 
a las mejores so relaciones entre estas dos. So we hope that we have contributed Wuhan, for the relation of these two no very important nations of the world that have a lot of history and a lot of history still to be written, and we will write it even if blood is needed. This was Walter Martiner, producer and host of Dossier, the Douyin program of Western Hemisphere of Satellite Information. Director, the floor is all yours. Peace, this is G1. This is Rod Star. Together we are Rebel Diaz. We coming at you with a new episode of Enya Enya, don't stop. This week we cover the visit of